Hi and welcome to the second series of my vodcast podcast. Today, talk's called Let's Talk About Sets, Baby. Mindsets. What is your, why is your glass half empty when mine is half full? Why does one person believe that the world is a cruel place when another feels like a kid in a candy store? What are the factors that define our behaviours, create our mindsets, and therefore our worldview? A big up to rebel wisdom, Daniel Schmachtenberger, and author Thomas Bjorkman. I tried to connect with Rebel Wisdom, an inspiring YouTube channel here in the UK, who put out interviews with the cutting edge philosophers who are emerging at this time. I tried several times in recent months, but sadly have heard nothing back from them. This kind of illustrates the world view that's so prevalent currently. There's an awful lot of speaking without much listening. I put my hand up too. If you send something to me on MSN Messenger, it could lay dormant there for months. I really do try to reply to every meal at the email I receive, though. There's an awful lot of people who see it as important to get the word out. But if you've ever been in a one-sided conversation, having to listen to a diatribe rather than a two-way interaction, you'll know how frustrating and how boring it can be. Social media has become this one-way street, and it's now so heavily curated by big business and politics that it's almost worthless. Please do not think that your new posts are raging far and wide like scouts discovering new territories. No, they just end up under the eyeballs of the same crowd of people who think and look like you. Rose-tinted spectacles? I suspect my wife wonders where I got them from and when. The truth is that I've always had them. But why? I had a pretty privileged upbringing compared to most. It was a bumpy start. I was adopted at about 10 days. Most psychologists agree that these kind of events leave an indelible mark on the psyche. For me, this is true. It's something I've explored and worked with extensively over the years. As a practitioner of Chinese medicine and Chinese psychology, I know only too well that these events, unexamined, lead to chronic illness in later life. I decided early on that I would try to be the best version of me, so no stone would lay unturned. Who knows when the work will be done, but at least I know where the shadows are cast. At some stage in my youth, I was struck by the good fortune of it all. When forced to tell the story to my friends, it was the choice to seek sympathy for poor baby Jeremy or state the amazing luck that I'd had. I was brought up in a stable, loving environment as a fourth child. By the time my parents got through three natural children, they'd calmed down quite a bit. They saw me as a gift. I was lucky to get a special place in their hearts. This information was communicated to me as often and as early as I remember. That's what led to me choosing to be a happy person. I see my life as a stroke of good luck. Life is all about choices. Our hormones are the results of our thinking process. Electromagnetic thoughts pass to the endocrine system which releases chemical messengers out into the body. However, you can choose to feel however you like. Sometimes the prevailing current of bad vibes in your body can be turned round if you decide you want to. It's the feeling in a blue funk and then deciding that going out for a walk in the woods is a better plan. It's feeling cross with your partner and then deciding not to continue hostilities. It's the snub you don't take personally the choice to feel different. And I understand the depression that the chemical process has gone into overdrive. So saying to someone who's clinging to breast, just change your mind, that isn't helpful. But I've been blessed with a very wide worldview. 
When you see the picture, the bigger picture, always, it's much easier to pull yourself out of the pit. It's the nobody died viewpoint. Master of the universe. When you go to public school in the UK, you join a very privileged group. However, there's a misconception that everybody is a stuck-up toff. <laughs> there was actually huge swathes of middle-class boys, almost no landed gentry or lords, and a small smattering of very rich students from overseas. I think you have to go to Eton or Harrow to meet the really high-class snobs. I didn't go there. Let's be clear. It is really middle-class. Very few people from a working class background made it there, making it a totally unrealistic slice of life. But also not making it like Tom Brown's school days entirely. Sure, there were moments of being beaten by prefects and the like, but only moments. I had a really nice mix of friends, normal people with normal worries and with ambitions for a better life. The teachers tended to fit that profile too. Middle class people from educated families. So what's the point I'm making? The ideas that were delivered were aspirational. They suggested possibility and success. They hinted at the finer things in life. They opened one's mind in many, many directions. It's a different world. My wife and I share differing worldviews. I'm Yang, she's Yin, but we rub along really well. What, after all, is the point of having a partner who agrees with everything you say? I think life would be really boring. That we are so different is really wonderful for me. Every day is a careful compromise for me. Every day is a challenge to consider somebody else's viewpoint before crashing on through life. She's from a farming community in the depths of Brazil, one stop short of the Amazon. She comes from a place where people often have to scrape a living, where the battle is fought between man, heat, snakes, viruses and bacteria, all day, every day. She only expected to be in the UK for a few years in an effort to make good, go home. I rather spoiled those plans for her. For her, life is not an easy place. Everything needs to be fought for. You don't get something for nothing. Her early life and education told her a very different story to mine. We see life through completely different lenses. It's good for me. It keeps my raging optimism in check. It keeps my feet on the ground. Money is the root of all evil. Well, what a load of nonsense. Of course, the root of all evil is the person wielding the money, usually Bill Gates. Money is energy. You get rewarded by society for putting your back to the wheel. Society gives you tokens to prove what you've done. As Thomas Bjorkman points out in his excellent essay, if we look at money from the perspective of the individual in a modern world, we are, one could argue, as individuals, equally dependent on money as we are on air or oxygen. We need, we need the air to breathe, we need the money to survive. If we look at the collective level of society as a whole, there's an important difference between money and oxygen. Because even if we gathered all the humans in the world and collectively decided we didn't want to be dependent on oxygen, we couldn't do anything about that. The natural world depends upon it. However, if humanity collectively decided that we wanted to have another way, other than money, to allocate our goods in society, then money could be gone tomorrow. Just take that in for a moment. Money, gone forever. Interesting. It's clear that it's a driving force. And also that humans don't react well around money. It tends to drive us a bit mad and make us a bit desperate. 
This begs the question, what about the various experiments around the globe suggesting that everybody gets a minimum wage? What would happen if that were to be ex accepted as the norm? Don't get me wrong, I feel there's a huge number of invested individuals who would be profoundly upset, who would spend their hard-earned cash to stop other slackers getting a free share of the pie. But just say it were possible. Again, we reference back to Thomas Bjorkman. He's suggesting that we can save the earth, whatever that might look like, by being free to use new thinking. Well, I partially agree with him. I really like the idea of inventing our way out of our impending disaster. I don't subscribe to the idea of zipping off to a nearby planet, pillaging that and then bringing back the resources to sustain what we're still doing. If you're a regular reader, you'll know that I'm a long-term student of a school of Qigong from China, founded in the 1970s by Dr. Pang Ming. His exercise form is used widely for healing chronic illness. Beyond the basics of its form, of his form, it's used as a method of self-cultivation. Rather than being tied to old-fashioned ideas from thousands of years ago that could only be transmitted to you by some teacher of the lineage or that sort of nonsense, Dr. Pang's ideas are tied to quantum science. The idea that by observing the now famous double slit experiment, we can start to see that we, the observers, are the creators of this experience that we call life. We start to see that we can change our path in our lives without masters or gurus or even gods. Although the more you look, the more implicit some universal force turns out to be. The bad news is, it's down to you. The good news is, it's down to you. <laughs> Dr. Pang translates Qigong into Qi, space and information. He explains that you've always had the power inside of you to fix you. He explains that with decent application, you can discover super normal abilities within. And eventually your true self, your connection, all there is. What? Did you say that I could be Superman? The fringes of science are always the place to look for the really interesting stuff. Nobody has explained to me why for the last 1,000 years the Catholic Church has had a series of saints who used to levitate in front of huge crowds. Have people been hallucinating for hundreds of thousands of years or just looking the other way because they can't describe it through current scientific understanding. There are scholarly news reports by esteemed doctors who have sat with an Indian guru who stopped his heart, stopped his heart for eight days and then restarted it, all carefully observed by doctors and ECG machines. I have personally witnessed students bending spoons, turning them like toffee. I've seen people turn pins magnetic with their minds and pick up other pins. I watched in amazement as one acquaintance plugged himself directly into the wall and then administered various gentle shocks with different voltages, all displayed on a voltmeter to a group of 15 of my students. He offered differing resistance, depending on what he knew you could manage. I got the full 220 volts. I saw the meter jump up. I have a film of this, if you think I'm crazy. The charge crept into my arm. Over the minute we were touching, it crawled up to my shoulder and my neck. It ended in my jaw, in a tooth that had been hurting on and off for days. And that day on, it never hurt again. Dr. Pang's suggestion is that time spelt, spent developing oneself through deep practice will slowly heal your old problems and start to develop latent abilities that all of us have. I've met many people who 
who have healed themselves and many who have developed themselves further. The final act. Well, it's tempting to think that this is a cult, but unfortunately there's nobody taking your money. There's nothing to join. Nobody's got any guns to offer you. Uh, only a bit of friendship on your journey to a healthier you. You don't have to become Superman, but maybe you could. Where do you think humanity got these Superman ideas from? You just have to hear stories of a mother lifting the back wheel of a car off her child's leg to know that deep inside are resources we didn't know we possessed. Individuals through history have known how to do this. It's now time for us all to give it a try. It's time for society to come together, not focusing on thinking of better ways to fix the world, but to do things to make us all better people. And in so doing, the world gets fixed. This is not a problem for philosophical thinking. It's a time for action of the self. If you work with me long enough, you'll start to see that war, struggle, hardship and fighting are all futile. If we stop raping the earth, if we start to live in humanity with each other and with our planet, things will heal really soon. This is not a grey, homogenous life with no joy, quite the reverse. It's really being alive. It's living a full, safe, happy life in total balance with everything around us and with each other. If we were to decide to make sure that every person has a meal, a safe house with water and drainage, in short, meet Maslow's hierarchy, then we would all have the space to spend time in self-development if we wanted. I hold this dream every day of my life. I also hold the optimistic dream that one day I'll win one of those crazy prizes on the lottery, 170 million pounds. If I get that tomorrow, you'll soon start to see spaces arriving where I will pay you to come on a self-development course. You can come on one right now with my school, Three Monkeys School of Qigong. Sadly, we're still in the old paradigm of you having to pay me, though. As scientist, author and philosopher Amit Goswami said when I interviewed him, he said, dooby dooby do. Now is the time for doing. As we say in Jinang Qigong, how la. Howl. It means everything is good already. <laughs>